Yeah, Will here. The trip that I'm on has a cultural side to it. In fact, one reason I'm, I'm traveling here in the Barrens, or especially in the snow country, because it involves culture. And I've traveled in, I've traveled these areas of the north for about 55 years now. And uh, many of these villages I've passed through over time. Uh, some of the villages I know, three generations of people. Uh, and they're an important part of why I travel up here in Canada. And I want to go give a little bit, bit of background on this. Um, first of all, in 1985, I, I took a 5,000-mile uh, trip from my cabin in Ely, Minnesota, to Point Barrow, Alaska. And uh, the next year, I was going to do the North Pole in 1986. And uh, I did this expedition for a while to show my sponsors in the National Geographic that I was capable of their sponsorship. And uh, so I took this long trip. And it averaged, I had an average about 28 miles a day in order to do it. And therefore, I really had to know the route. Uh, you just don't pick up like a highway map, but there's a intricate route of a village to village. Some of the villages are hundreds of miles apart. Some of these areas I traveled in, some areas uh, I was not too familiar with. Um, one area actually I traveled up in the fall. I flew into a village on Lake Rocher, which is about 700 miles west of here. And, um, and I spent time there to learn the routes and so forth. But the reason I was able to accomplish this long trip, in addition to just doing it, uh, was because I, I understood the routes and how the people travel. Uh, generally, there are sometimes from one village to another, uh, there are uh, trails, which would be snowmobile trails, uh, sometimes dog sled trails. Now, we're talking away from the road. There's no, I mean, roads are, in these areas I'm speaking about, there's no road, of course, around them. And then some of the villages are too far apart. And what I would always do is find out where the trapper trails are, and I would follow the trapper trails as far out as I could go. And then from there, I'd be on my own. And if I had necessary, possible, I'd pick up some information on where the other trappers were at in the next village. And that that's where I would head for us, that other the trapper that was way far out. And if I picked up on that trapper, then I had that trail to follow back down into the next village. So this whole system of of uh, trails, uh, a lot of it's trapper, trapping trails. Um, a lot of sometimes they have these winter carnivals uh, in uh, midwinter uh, where the people travel uh, from village to village. They might have a winter carnival in one town. Uh, then the next week it would be another town. So uh, these would be carnival trails, and those were very easy to travel on, well packed down, even an older carnival trail that was a month old. Uh, it was still a trail. It wouldn't have to break trail. Now, the snow country, which I had traveled in thousands of miles, and it's deep snow. I mean, it's really serious stuff, way steep, you know, minimal. Uh, and when I traveled by dog team, I traveled 10 dogs and, you know, single line. And my sled itself is only 14 inches wide, just enough to, I always traveled with skis, and just enough to follow the, the ski trail. So I was uh, you know, specialized that kind of that way for travel. And, and the Native people also would travel in single line uh, dogs in this area. They used toboggan sleds, dogs and toboggan sleds when they used snowmobiles. So to travel in this country, you have to, first of all, uh, be familiar with the trails, uh, and which means you get very familiar. You meet a lot of people, and I'm always getting information about trails. Like the Native people up here, I'm always interested in conditions, trails, you know, the seasons, the situation. Uh, whenever I have conversations, I'm, uh, you know, I'm asking questions about trails or listening to what they have to say. And uh, so I'm in this this uh, mindset of uh, traveling on the trails and also, you know, working with the people, the culture, and understanding the culture from a white person's perspective. Um, on this expedition uh, or trip that I took, um, I first I passed through Black Lake in 1985 on this way to Alaska, so I was familiar with Black Lake, and, and I was only spent a night there, but I met a number of people. People were so good to me at that Black Lake, and I never forget that. It was really together community, and I traveled through. But then last summer, uh, Molly Reichardt and I did a canoe trip down the Fond du Lac River, which flows into the Black Lake, and then we ended up in Black Black Lake, the village itself. So I was trying to get a sense of the country there at that time. 
on the route that I took, uh, I studied the maps for a long time. I was trying to figure out how to get through the snow country to get into the Barrens. So once on the Barrens, I'm fine. It's a, snow pa- it's a real hard-packed snow. And I figured out this route uh, down the shipment, the route that I'm on now. But then uh, I later found out it was just a traditional route. I mean, it's been used for thousands of years, so it's, a, it's not, not like any type of discovery at all. It's a natural route. Um, the shipment porridge was part of that. So, and uh, so on, a, on the on this trip, though, I figured there'd be a really good route going to the Barrens because the uh, caribou passed by. Traditionally, the caribou are north of here, Selwyn Lake, and further north. So, uh, if the caribou pass by, uh, all all the people I mean, uh, by snowmobile travel from Black Lake, and it's just like a rigor highway. Uh, when you're on a hunting trail like that, it's just you know, a dog sled or even hauling a canoe here when it's 20 below, really easy. Uh, but this year, the uh, caribou did not pass through, so. Uh, that was one of the issues that I had. I knew there were several trappers up in this area, uh, so I knew there would be somewhat of a trail. Uh, but uh, So I was familiar with the terrain. So when I left Black Lake about 10 days ago, I, you know, I, I work out a little bit for these trips, but I, uh, you know, I generally just kind of jump in. So immediately I started uh, in a storm on my first day out. And uh, it was easy going the first five miles outside of Black Lake because I could trail, and the trail slowly got less and less. And um, I traveled about eight hours, and then I met another trapper, uh, trapper hunter, uh, Fred, an older fellow uh, in the middle of the storm. He came down uh, from Selvin Lake, and uh, he gave me a lot of great information uh, about the trail. I, it, was, it was a relief seeing him because I knew there was a fresh trail at that time. I didn't know I'd get a whole foot of snow here in the next three days when I met him. But um, Fred is a typical, very typical, uh, you know, in our civilization, you think of the great hunter. Uh, well, all the men up here, at least all the men that lived on the, in the, in the uh, you know, before the last 20 years, uh, everybody was a hunter and a trapper because that, if you weren't a hunter, you, you didn't survive. So you know, it's taken for granted that you're, you're a good, everybody's here is a good hunter and a good trapper. And trapping was a way of, um, the currency was used to be fur. And for a couple hundreds of years, and that's how, uh, all the northern Athabascan, uh, Denai people, uh, survived through trapping, through the trapping they could get the basics. And with wood, they could build their cabins and have fire, and their culture went on. And then in the 70s, though, the fur market collapsed, uh, uh, Greenpeace, and, you know, for better or for worse, uh, when that fur market collapsed, uh, the economy, basically, uh, culture really took a really bad hit here. But um, Fred was uh, ended up being uh, 68 years old and, and uh, pretty talkative considerably, you know, for a, a Native person. And uh, he turned out to be about 68 years old. He gave me information on the trail. So then I went on into the storm the next two and a half days. I made it to the other side of Black Lake, and the storm had cleared up. And then I made a, a portage, uh, my first run, about 10 miles by uh, about 80 pounds a year, and I came back. And the fifth day I rested because I was just really exhausted. And uh, it was snowing again on that fifth day. But later that afternoon, a snowmobile came by, uh, came up the trail, which I was a little surprised. And and uh, a fellow that became very good friends with, uh, Jason Cook, and his wife, Bernadette, were on it. And they were going to go up the hill some on the porridge and, and have a, a campfire. And they just came back from hunting, and they were very successful. Uh, with caribou, and they were going to have kind of a, a bonfire and so forth, a fire and, and, and meet some, eat some caribou meat and so forth. They invited me up. So that was my introduction uh, to these wonderful people. And um, I, I, I uh, skied up to where the fire was, and uh, Bernadette offered me some dried caribou, which I was a little shy and polite, and I, and I, and I said no, no thanks because I thought, you know, they were short on that. But I know a little bit, I know. Uh, it was an insult that I didn't take uh, her meat, but but uh, as good of a person as she saw, she saw from my kind of a culture where I was coming from, uh, she understood that. But uh, so at, around that fire, uh, we had ribs, and uh, they cooked up the head of the caribou that they steamed over the fire to bring back to their children. Bernadette was uh, six months pregnant. 
a mother of uh, four other children, well, Jason's children, and her children, uh, all her kids are under uh, 15 years old. Just really a, really a wonderful, wonderful person. Uh, she's a social worker in town. She works with uh, kids that are abused and at risk and so forth. And uh, and Jason does you know, hunting and trapping, whatever he he can manage to do. So uh, they said that, uh, Jason said he'd help me out on the trail the next day. So I, you know, thought well it'd be great. So they I came back to my camp and then they took back off to Black Lake and then I made the portage the next day and, and Fred came back. He came up from town. We talked again for a while. And then uh, he took off. I thought I had a great trail ahead of me, and I hauled up the canoe uh, over this Chipman Portage, which is a tough portage, and I uh, made it to the other side. And Fred came back because of the big, deep slush and so forth, and we talked again for a while. And I could tell he was a little concerned about me. We talked about a number of things, and, uh, you know, he's, uh, and, uh, it was really kind. When he left, left me, he put his hand on my shoulder, which is, uh, you know, it's something that, you know, I often see that Native people are much on gestures like that, and touching and so forth, but I could see that there was a, uh, a concern, but then a respect. And, but uh, what kind of happened in Black Lake, I hear this hearsay, but you know, I just arrived at the lake, the 73-year-old, to be their elder, you know, rides by canoe and then it takes off in a storm, hitting off with the parents, and uh, it caused a little bit of an interest, I guess, uh, in the community. And then uh, about an hour or so after I completed that portage, uh, Jason came along with his friend and brother, uh, Billy, Nathan, Nathan is called, and his, his friends call him Billy. And uh, so they came to help break trail. And, uh, and it was just simply incredible what these guys did. Because this snow was so deep, there's no way I would have made this over. Uh, Fred's trail had already drifted in, in with uh, two hours now, a trail I'm talking about, two feet of snow, you know, uh, deep snow in the, on the lake with slush underneath it, which is really quite dangerous. And uh, normally that slush will freeze up and a snowmobile goes over it. But that trail, even on the smaller lakes, because of the wind and all the snow, unusual snow, it drifted over. But So Billy and uh, Jason, we had a snowmobile with a uh, uh, toboggan on the end. They took some of my gear, and uh, we made... You know, we pushed all that rest of the day through just incredible hard, hard stuff, and they worked so hard for uh, for me. And I, I compensated them the uh, best I could. I always carry a little bit of money along for uh, in case something like this happens, so you'd be able to compensate for people that really put out. A lot, a lot of people don't expect anything, but uh, but when they're running gas and, and machinery and all that, you know, you can't be expecting anybody. Really, you have to support that part of it, and, uh, and I was fortunate. I, ha I had some Canadian money on me, and, and uh, we made a camp. Uh, they had to go back for gas and that. And we uh, we stayed up to about one o'clock in the morning. It's super cold, three o'clock, or about thirty below that night. Northern Lights, and uh, they were debating back and forth, and then they decided at one o'clock they were just going to take off. And I slept in the open that night. Uh, then the next day was super cold, clear, but uh, in uh, the forest there, a real dense forest, it was uh, you know, real kind of dull. The sun wasn't really shining, and they showed up again, uh, this time kind of late, uh, around the afternoon, and we pushed on again. And uh, this time we made another camp together. We uh, spent the night in their, their small tent. We went to bed around probably 1.30 or so. Um, uh, Native people like that, they, they don't run on a white person's schedule. They're not dictated by a clock. We're, we're always like, we know the time, we do this, and we eat at this time, we go to bed at this time. They just do, you know, whatever. When they sleep, they sleep, and they sometimes go a long time without much sleep, and then they sleep a lot. Uh, so around uh, one thirty or so, I mean, we, and we became such really good friends, and uh, Jason really took me under his wing. He was... Uh, 35, and uh, he was raised by his grandfather, Leon, whose cabin I'm staying in right now. Um, and uh, Leon treated him very well. His his, father, his parents abandoned him when he was a child, and uh, but Leon uh, took him on and raised him in the bush, raised him in this cabin that I'm at right now. 
but um, uh, Chase took so much time to show me things. I'm always a total sponge. Anything that I hear from Native people, I register it. I mean, I don't. I have a photographic memory with maps and information and trails. Any little tidbit of information, I just totally absorb it. I know it, and also it's so logical anyway. Uh, but he was—he gave me so much great information, and and it was not just uh, him always, you know, showing me this and that. It's just the way he was. And uh, and Billy was really quiet, but really a hard worker. He was always did the fires and. Um, and uh, very close friends. And um, then the next day that we uh, broke camp, uh, we slept in until, that must have been 10 when the sun came up a bit. And then we made the cabin here, the Leon's cabin. And uh, we, uh, he helped me out with some firewood here. This would have been yesterday. Uh, and the history of this cabin is quite interesting. It's, uh, I'll talk maybe a little bit more about this cabin later on in, in another one, but then uh, I'm going to stay here for a few days and run relays north up this, this uh, Selwyn Lake, and then um, Jason's going to be back to uh, help me on the trail again, and then I'll, I'll be able to spend a little bit more time there. And uh, so um, I'll check out here on this recording over and out.